we're in this trend from going from on-premise systems to what we call hybrid IT. And hybrid IT involves a lot more sophisticated automation across systems that are in the cloud, uh, systems that are more SaaS or oriented, and then really a lot of open source technologies that out there that we might be using to build applications are yourself. And so the, these extensions are really meant to kind of be things that talk to any of these different new platforms that we're doing automation with. Uh, we use the word orchestration. And what's key to the orchestration is being able to integrate really with anything that you have today, but also the, any new things that might come up as we kind of migrate to this hybrid IT landscape. When we think of uh, extensions, we really look at them in particular business domains. Uh, we've got the traditional business domains of jobs and workloads, and then also integrating into backend business systems uh, like SAP, Oracle, ServiceNow. But with the hybrid IT landscape, there's a lot of um, things that are gonna be hosted on the cloud through service providers. There's a lot of new types of capabilities you're, you're, you're doing with data ops and DevOps. And each of these different areas has a lot of different third-party products, a lot of open source that's being used. And if we wanna automate these, we really have to be able to integrate very quickly and very easily with each of these different types of products. And so when we look at UAC, we, we want to go deep into, into those automation um, areas in each of these different domains, but then also kind of provide a whole back plane, single pane of glass for trying to orchestrate automation that might expand these areas too. Uh, so we've, we actually do a lot of integrations into automation tools themselves that might be used specifically in these domains but also trying to span it also. So you get kind of a overall view of all the automation happening throughout your IT landscape. A good way to look at this is at the very top, we've got um, a foundation of a central automation tool through the, con the controller and then agents that you have deployed. These are very, um, these have been around a long time. They're very robust. And what we want to do is really be able to kind of go down to the next layer, which is really providing a lot of these extensions. And these, while the product go, is typically on a six month release cycle, these extensions can be built almost on a weekly basis. Um, we release them all the time. Um, we've had people that have developed extensions in a matter of days and so that they don't have to wait for these long release cycles, which is really important in, in today's world because of how fast uh, the shifts are happening from on-premise to cloud and new technologies are coming up just about every day. Once we have this foundation of integrations, there's the solution layer. So all these integrations are typically tied together in a workflow and these workflows support some type of business process or handling some type of um, uh, business process that goes across the, the do domains we just talked about. A good example of these is data pipelines, uh, which, which we talk a lot about. A lot of the integrations we see have to do with data ops and building data pipelines, which is really a workflow of how data comes in and then gets put into some sort of a an, an analytics engine and the result being put into a dashboard or some sort of an API. So all of those re require integrations to have that whole process built up in a workflow. The um, UAC pass was again, just really the controller and the agent. When you look at what we're building out and we talk about the extensions and de development platform, it's really a library of these extensions and, and integrations, and you can typically get those on the innovation hub that we have. But then also uh, tools in what we have a development platform, which is how do we make tools available that we use ourselves, but also enable customers and partners to build those themselves and do it in a very rapid way. The concept of this is also gonna be where you build workflows and all of this can be provided through an app store type concept to where you can be in, in the controller and, and be able to have access to these extensions very, very easily. If we dive down a little bit into what do we mean by the development platform, it, fo it follows a very tr traditional de development platform if you're using uh, some other tool. When you talk about the, the platform, you have to have tools. So everything typically is done through the IDE, 
and the IDEs we provide plugins for. So when you're within the IDE, you can interact with UAC and you can inter interact with the templates and the tools that build and package our, our extensions. They also have an API and a CLI tool so that if you like working at the, at the command line, you can do everything from the command line or can integrate that into your IDE of, of choice. With any de the development platform, it's really important to have documentation. So quick start guides, a developer guide, API reference, all of those things are going to be there so that you have all the information you need to kind of build your own extensions. And then probably most importantly is templates and samples. It's really important that you don't build everything from scratch. Typically, you start from some sort of a template that provides you uh, a quick way to get started and also in, implements best, best practices. So within the, the development platform, we're going to be, we be providing lots of samples and templates that people can start from. And then the delivery side is, is, is a key aspect. T -t Today, we have the Innovation Hub where you can download these. But from within the tools, you can actually deploy straight into to UAC without actually having to go in, into UAC. So you can get into this very rapid um, dev test cycle through each of your development environments, whether you have a dev environment, test environment, and then ultimately being able to deploy it to a production environment. And we have our tools being integrated in with uh, popular build, build systems like GitLab and, and Azure DevOps. So these tools are meant to be built into these very um, sophisticated, continuous CI, CD type, type processes. Just to get into an, an example of how uh, you'll see CMOS doing the demo, he's going to be working in the IDE and at the, at the command line. And so he's going to be using those tools to actually build the extension and one thing we wanted to make sure that we did was being able to debug and test the extension without it having to be deployed to the controller. So what we have is, is an ability to kind of run it in a standalone fashion to try to get as, as much test debugging time as possible because that's very rapid. But then also being able to, once you're done with that, to package not just the code up, but also any libraries that need to be deployed with it. So that gets deployed up into the controller and can get sit, sent down to the agent. Uh, why that's important is because you don't want to have to go install any software on the agent where it's it's running. Uh, that's a that's kind of a big that you may not have access to, to the machine and it also takes time. So we try to bundle everything that's required, all the dependency all the dependencies into this package that gets de that gets deployed down. We've we've chosen the Python language too. Python was one of the most popular programming languages. And so it's being used a lot in the cloud ecosystem. Uh, it's very easy to, to, to learn. It's kind of a good language that bridges the scripting world and also the, the kind of programming languages like, like Java and C, and C Sharp. The other benefit is that it's got an, a, a large amount of open source libraries so that you can um, have access to libraries that do a lot of different functions and most of the application um, vendors are creating Python libraries that wrap their, a their APIs. So there's, there's a lot of reusability out there that you can pull into your extensions and help speed up the um, development of those extensions to integrate into a number of different systems and software packages. So getting into what the life cycle of an extension is, a long time ago, we used to just run scripts at the OS level, and we used to pass things in. The script would, would run, and we would take the, the result out. These days, that's very crude. We see that automation has to be more real-time, that you have to be able to interact with a system in your workflow, not just at the start and the end, but while it's, it's running also. So one of the capabilities we've built into the um, integration platform is really being able to do this real-time communication between the controller and, ex and, the, and the extension that will be running somewhere. So obviously, from the, from the controller, we're going to download everything that's needed to run that extension to, to the agent. Uh, we're also going to give it a payload, and that payload could be any data that you've configured for that extension. It could be credentials that you have up, 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 in the, up in the controller, but it also could be variables that, have, that are being passed around a whole workflow or in, or in, in between tasks. 
that universal agent is going to execute the integration. So it's going to start it and has a start method that you'll see that actually begins it running. Then the integration, while it's running, can send event, events back to the controller. Now, why this is important is because those events can take other actions in the controller. It can actually kick off other integrations to be executed uh, while this other integration is running. So now you can listen for events coming for, from this integration that might be running for, could be minutes, could be hours, and take other actions based on things happening. We can also send updates. So as it's running, it can send updates. It could be how far it's in, in its running. It could be how many records it's, it's, it's processed. And these updates can be seen on the UI in the controller. So if you have a long running extension, then you can get real time updates on it. We also can send com commands down to the extension while it's running. So you don't have to actually wait till it's until it's done to see what happened or to make it do something, something else. You can actually send commands down and then that extension can take um, any sort of action that, that it may need to do based on that command coming. And then obviously we have a completion going back up. So once the, the extension is done running, it can send um, a complete message back up and then it can have a payload of anything that it wants to send up to the controller. And then the controller can take that data and take some action on it or pass data around to other tasks with, within the workflow. So you can see here, it's a very real-time co communication back and forth, not just start and then wait for, for something to, to, to stop. Uh, a few other things, you can cancel an extension running. So if, what, if it's a, an extension that might take a long time to run and you wanna stop it, you, you can hit a cancel command. And then you can also, well, during the configuration phase, so when you're configuring an, an extension, there's sometimes values that you want to get from the system. A good example here, maybe if you want to talk to AWS S3 and get the list of buckets that you want to um, use for, for your extension, in the drop-down field, it'll ask AWS for all the bucket lists, and then it'll come back to the controller, and you, you can configure which, which bucket you want to use uh, for that extension. Um, we see that uh, very handy so that you don't have to know ahead of time certain certain things about the system that you're configuring the extension to run against. Let's have a look at the dev environment. Uh, locally, we have set up a Linux VM, and in this VM we have installed UAC on version 7.3, Python on version 3.7, UIPCLI, uh, which is a Python tool we provide and facilitates creating building, packaging, and deploying extensions, and VS Code with UIP plugin already installed. At this point, I need to mention that the UIP plugin uh, is a wrapper of UIP CLI, so if you don't use VS Code, you will get the same functionality through UIP CLI from the terminal. On the AWS side, we have one EC2 instance running. Uh, we, have, we have configured SSM service to monitor this instance. And of course, we have already created the access keys that we will need. As an example extension to build, we have decided to create an extension that integrates with Amazon SSM service, which is used to manage applications and infrastructure running in AWS cloud. In our case, we will be sending uh, cell commands to SSM service, and this service will be running them on the EC2 instance. Those commands will be just creating PXT files. For those of you that are familiar with the service, we will be using AWS Run Cell uh, Script document. Through this demo, we will try to give you some practical examples on how to use various features of uh, the extensions, like having, a, having an extension that supports multiple input fields, some of them being dynamic choice fields, so you can fetch options from the system or from a remote service when creating a new task, how to securely store credentials and provide them as input to your tasks, how to extract real-time operational information from a running instance. Regarding the coding session, uh, it is based on, based on iterations. So um, as a first step, we are creating a new out-of-the-box extension, deploying locally and running a new task based on it. As a next step, we enhance it adding fields and the corresponding Python code. Then we add the logic for actually running commands on the EC2 instance. 
And finally, we set up the mechanism for real-time feedback from the extension to the controller. Let's start by validating our local dev environment. First of all, UAC is up and running locally. An EC2 instance is up and running and monitored by AWS SSM service. And UIP plugin is already installed uh, in VS Code. In this page, there is much information about the plugin. Uh, you can have a look on all uh, the available commands for this plugin. Now we are ready to proceed with creating our new extension. Let's do this through terminal uh, by creating a specific directory for this demo. In this directory, we are going to initiate our extension using UIP CLI and using a specific uh, template provided by our uh, uh, plugin. Uh, on top of this, we just need to provide the extension name, which in our case will be UESSM. Initialization uh, was successful. Let's have a look on the files created. Let's open the folder. I will deep dive on uh, the most important files you need to know of. Uh, first of all, uh, we have setup CFG, setup PI, because our packaging mechanism is uh, dependent on setup tools. Regarding the extension specific files, uh, we have extension YAML, which contains the metadata of this new extension. You need to adapt this file according to your needs. Extension.pi. Uh, contains the Python implementation of the extension, just the class, the initialization, and the execution entry point of our extension. The um, execution has three parts. As you can see, first part is parsing the input data from the template. Second part is, second part is uh, executing the command. Third part is providing some response to the controller, successful or failed response. Finally, we have template.json, uh, which file is more or less the specification of our extension. Um, it contains many different um, attributes useful for the controller, but in our demo, we are going to focus on the fields attribute, which now is an array containing only a single uh, element, which is action related because our template, the out of the box template, provides only one field. Before moving on, I need to update the name of the extension. Let's call it AWS SSM. This is the human uh, friendly name that we are going to see in the controller. And finally, let me update the minimum Python version we want uh, this extension to run on. Let's have this 3.7. Now we are ready to build and deploy this extension to the controller and test it. But before this step, we need to configure our UIP uh, plugin. So all the information needed for uploading the extension to the controller uh, are part of the configuration and we shouldn't have to provide it again and again in all steps in this demo. So let's press F1, UIP, set, URL first. We need to set the target controller URL. In our case, uh, it is running in localhost, so this value is, uh, is correct for us, uh, so we keep it. Then we set the user uh, that we're going to use as a client to the controller. In our case, it is OPS admin. Then we need to set the password for this user. It is set and finally we need to set a target task. Throughout this demo we are going to be running some tasks. Um, all of them will be named task1. So this configuration is not repeated uh, and changed throughout the demo. So let's set task1. Now we are ready to build and package and deploy. 
we can do this by UIP push all. It is done uh, already, it is, it is running successfully. Let's see uh, what is the result of this command in, uh, in UC. We need to refresh the services. Here we have a new service. We need to add it to the favorites. Let's do the same. Okay, templates are also part of the favorites. Let's try to create a new task and run it. So we are sure that the out of the box implementation is uh, running correctly. Let's name it task one. Let's provide to an agent. Let's keep the print to SDR default action. Let's save it. Launch the task. The instance is already completed. Retrieving output. We get hello SD out in SD out. We can do the same from our ID. Pressing F1 and UIP task launch. We can launch another instance from task one and get the output in our um, um, terminal. Now, let's start enhancing this extension by adding some uh, new fields in its template. Let's move on to the template uh, section, to the fields. Let's edit action. We have two choices. I want to keep one of them. I will remove the second one and I will edit the first one to create files. I need to add another one called AWS Credentials. This will be a type of credential and a mandatory one. The third one is AWS Region. This will be of type choice uh, and let me add a dummy choice for now because we're going to change it down the road. R1 Region 1. Finally, we need to have instance, so I create a new field called instance ID. <coughs> Again, this is a choice field with a dummy value I1. Now the template is updated. Uh, but currently is hosted uh, in the controller. In order to continue um, enhancing our extension and write some code based on the new fields, we need to fetch this template to our project. We can do this by uh, our IDE by using UIP pull. This command identifies the changes and pulls the new template JSON locally. Let's see it. Now you will see that in fields array, we don't have one element, we have more than one. We have, of course, action as before, but now we have credentials, region, and instance ID. Now we are ready to add some code to our extension. Let's go to extension.pi. Let me start by overwriting extension start method. Again, the, the flow will be the same. Uh, the first step in this method uh, will be parsing uh, the input fields, but in this case, we will use a helper method for this. Second step will be executing the actual action. In this stage, we, we will just create a log for this action and create a successful result after, after printing the log. And then a third step is to return this successful result to the controller. Let me fetch this method too.
what this method does is uh, it has fields sun input as input uh, and fetches and returns a Python dictionary as output. So let's try to build and run this. We can do this with UIP push all. Build package and deploy. And then we can use UIP task launch. We get a failure because the AWS credentials field is required. It is a new field, but it doesn't have any value in the controller. Let's try to add a value there. We navigate to the task, to task one, and we now see that AWS credentials is empty. We need to provide some credentials here. There, is, there are some credentials already in the um, controller, but I will create a new uh, set of credentials just to, to show you how it is done. So let me call this credentials2, for example. Um, I will provide the key ID in username field and secret key in password field. And of course, these credentials are stored locally uh, in our controller. Let's provide also uh, region1 and instance1 and save it and get back to the terminal, run once again task launch task one. Now we get a successful result. We just see uh, the, um, the printed log. At this stage, I would like to show you how you could use the debugger to debug your code. First of all, we need to switch to debug mode, then add some configurations because they are not provided out of the box with the default template. Uh, let's choose API, let's use control space for autocomplete and we get extension start as, a, as an option. Choosing it, we get most of the, of the values pre-filled for us. We need to provide the name, debug start for example. Uh, let's provide some um, action value, create files. This value is validated against our template. So if I provide this, I get a validation error. I need to provide the correct action. Uh, regarding credentials, username and password, I will provide dummy values because at this point it is not important. We are, going, we are not going to use the debugger integrating with AWS. I will provide pass for password, R1 for region and I1 for instance. Everything is right. Now that uh, the configuration is validated, we get um, uh, our controls right on, on, the, on the left. Let's try to add some breaking point here. And let's trigger the execution. And we see that the debugger stops actually at the breakpoint. Nothing special to, to mention here. It is a classical debugger, but I just wanted to, to show you how you can build the configuration and start the debugger uh, up to, to this level. So I terminate the debugger and push forward. Our next step is to change the dynamic choice field values, the dummy ones, to some useful ones, enhancing the user experience. We need to move to the template to do this. Choose the template and the corresponding fields. First of all, AWS region. We need to make it dynamic without dependent fields. And save it. Regarding the instance ID, we will do the same, but in that case, we will have dependent fields. Why? Because the field values uh, in other fields will be used to communicate to AWS, query SSM service and fetch the values that will be used uh, for this drop-down menu. So we need the credentials and the region. Uh, credentials is in credential field one 
and region is in choice field 2. So, the values of these fields will be provided to the execution environment that will fetch the, the dynamic choice fields, dynamic choices uh, for this field. Let's fetch uh, once again the template from the controller locally. UIP pool. The template is updated. And now we need to uh, add the methods that will handle the queries for the drop down menus. First of all, we need to add this method, which um, queries AWS regions. Uh, the regions are hard coded in our extension, basically fetched locally. Even though hard coding values is not great, this uh, code is uh, just for demonstration. Those values could also be uh, coming from uh, uh, a global variable in the system, something like this. Uh, the intention here is to show that you can fetch some values locally. And of course, this method is mapped to this template field. Of course, we need to import this. And we are done for AWS region. Let's now uh, add the code regarding the other field. Yet again, we have another similar method with the decorator mapping this method to this field. In this method, we do the following. First of all, we parse input parameters. Here we have the dependent fields. Uh, based on these, we create an SSM client. Uh, we query for running instances. We parse the result and provide um, the, uh, a response to the uh, controller with the available uh, values. Of course, we need to import some additional things here. First of all, we need to add this method that creates the SSM client. Uh, what it does is that based on the params, which are basically three, key ID, key secret, and region, creates a new session and a new client and returns this client to the calling code. And of course, for all of this to happen, we need bot of three. First of all, we need to import bot of three. Then we need to create a requirements txt. and provide our uh, bottle library in it. In this specific case, we are hosting uh, the bottle3 library in our GitLab uh, environment. Um, so this is the link for this. And finally, we need to update the setup PI package, the setup PI file to facilitate the package, the correct package of the bottle3 library because we need to also include payment JSON files um, in, the, in the final package. We save everything and now uh, we will try to build UIP push all. We will try to build everything, package everything and deploy. and it was successful. Let's now see what changes for the user uh, in the controller. Let's find task one, our existing task. And now we can see that the interface has changed a bit. We have some icons here. Currently we have R1, the old value, but now we can fetch the new uh, list of values in runtime. Now, this is the new list of values. And of course, EU West one is the right one to be used as input for this field. Let's try to fetch. 
Uh, so here you see the dependent fields, credentials and region with the values. So we submit. Now our extension queries SSM and hopefully has fetched the result. This is the result actually because here you can see that this is the running instance. So now we have seen um, that we can fetch dynamic um, fields values from both locally and remotely. Now that we have uh, set up correctly uh, the dynamic choice fields in our extension and we can locate uh, the correct instance in SSM, what is left is to provide an actual implementation uh, of our action, create files. To do this, we are going back to our code. We are going to enhance our um, extension start method, basically removing this log and replacing it with uh, a call to an actual uh, method that provides this functionality. Actually, we need to delete this file too, this line too. Let me fetch this method. What this method does is that it creates five uh, files just touching them in the remote uh, file system in home uh, EC2 user directory and sleeping for five seconds in between. So we have the time to, to notice the progress of the, of the execution. To make this happen though, we need to have an SSM client uh, in our extension. Build SSM client is already imported uh, from previous stage and uh, now we can uh, save the SSM client, the generated SSM client in, in the object. We also need to fetch this method run cell command. What this command does, what this method does, uh, is that for a specific instance ID, it runs uh, AWS run cell script for a with a specific command. Which command? This is the task command. And then just waiting for uh, the completion of the, of the command with a max delay of one second. So basically, this uh, action calls this method, which creates uh, in an iteration five different files, waiting for five seconds uh, in between the files. I think what is missing now is to import time uh, for this functionality. So let's import time and we should be ready for building and deploying. Let's try. It is successful. Let me open a terminal so we can see, we can watch the changes happening. We can see that we don't have any txt files here. Let me add the watch. And let's go back and try to run our task. Let's launch task. Task one, of course. And it is running. Let's go back to the to our watch, and we should we should uh, see files being generated. If everything goes 
as planned. No, it is wrong. Okay, the, the value is wrong here. I know the, what the problem is. This is the problem. Now let's try to do this once again. And now we can see that the files are created. And file five, here it is. And it should be done. Successful. We have removed all logs. We're fine. As a final touch uh, for, the, for our extension, I want to add some uh, output only field so um, we get updates uh, on the execution without having to run a watch on the actual instance. So I will start by updating the template. and adding one new field. I will call it files created. And in this case, it will be output only. I'm saving and of course, pulling the template once again, UIP pull. Now, I just need to update uh, this field whenever a new file is created. So let me find the code that creates the files. It is in this loop. So after we create, uh, we send the, the command, we will uh, update the files created with the count, which starts from one and goes to five in our case let's save let's build once again and deploy meanwhile let me stop this let me remove all txt files Uh, our new uh, extension is deployed. Let's we try to run. Be task launch, task launch, task one. It is running. So let's find this task. This instance basically. Let's move to the instances. Something is not right. Yes, of course. We forgot to import. Uh, this module. We need to push again. and then launch once again. So this is running. Let's open this and we have the files created uh, output only field. As, as I update, you see this counter um, is increasing. As the files are created, this, this field is updated. So this is a, a small example of how an instance uh, can update uh, the user on uh, the progress of the execution.
One last thing that I wanted to talk to you about is uh, the extension cancel method you could use in order to do any cleanup before an instance is uh, terminated, is cancelled by the user basically. Um, we don't have any code for this because the time window is very limited, uh, but for our case, for our example, in this method you could implement the removal of the txt files you show me uh, remove by hand. It is a nice uh, method uh, and used in many of our uh, um, extensions. One of the things that we're trying to do is to really have a developer not have to leave the IDE as so that they can do everything from the IDE just to kind of get that speed there. And, and you saw that not only can he debug in the IDE, but he can upload changes to the controller. He can execute the task from from the IDE and, and get a response back. I, I know CMOS, you had a couple of um, errors that, that you had to go back and change, but you can see the errors coming back. And that's the whole focus of trying to make it very, very quick to develop these extensions. Previously, we, we had to go back and forth. You had to go to the controller, upload it, run it, get the result back, and you had to go back to the IDE. But we really want to make this very much focused on the IDE. And, and one thing that CMOS didn't show, but we have customers doing, and we do it ourselves, is, is what we call jobs as code, where you can take the configuration of the task, pull that down to the IDE, and then actually modify it there and have it upload the task versus having to do everything through the UI. So a lot of the things you saw him do through the UI, if you pull down the definition of that task into the IDE, you can actually just make changes in the JSON and, and up, upload it. And so we're, the, probably the, the other thing about the development platform is we're constantly up, updating it. It is not something that is tied to a release of UAC. It's actually its own um, version. And we're releasing updates to the command line tool as well as the VS Code plugin so that you can get updates and new capabilities as soon as they're they're ready. Do these individual integrations have their own virtual environments, i.e. divergent library requirements, stemming from it being a big challenge with Python and all the possible library dependencies? Tell us, you want to take take that one? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it's integration has its own library dependencies, uh, which are packaged into the single integration, which then it is packaged and download towards the agent, right? So the execution of it, it is inside the integration. The, the libraries are packaged within the integration, so they are not polluting, let's say, the environment. Okay, so let's say it's somehow, let's say it's uh, sandboxed. Okay, it's not required to pre install the dependent libraries on the agent side. Okay, so we understand the problem and understand the reason for this question because if you start installing too many libraries within a single Python environment, then it becomes unmanageable because of the different interdependencies between different libraries, right? By having, let's say, the libraries packaged inside the integration, this solves the problem. So there's no issue around that in our case. Yeah, and, and one, one more comment on that. You can actually specify the Python version to execute mm -hmm. when, you know, when it's run on, on the system where, where the agent is. And mm -hmm. the, um, like Telus was saying, all the dependencies are packaged up in a zip file, and those dependencies take precedence over, over any local de dependencies that might be there. Mm -hmm. we use public Python packages or do we need to host internally? Definitely you can use the, the, one, the ones out there. That is the whole idea of being able to rapid, uh, to do rapid development using, let's say, other open source libraries. Of course you can. Can we modify extensions downloaded from the integration hub? Yes, this is a, a quite interesting question, Peter. I don't know if you want to take it. Yeah, I'll, sure, sure, sure. Tell us. Yeah, so when when you download an integration from the Innovation Hub, you actually get all the source code, and you can use it as is, and they come with a lot of functionality. But we know that customers are are, are going to probably want to put their own business logic, maybe, or there may be some other API that they want to implement. So customers are are free to take those and modify them, pull them into their local de development environments, and change them.
Well, obviously, once you do that, you kind of get down a divergent code path. So if we we update the ones in, on the innovation hub often for could be fixes, could be enhancements. So you just need to be mindful of when there's a new version in the innovation hub, you might want to download that and then and then update your version that you have locally so that you do get those new features and those any any defect fixes with it. What is the benefit to using this instead of a universal template? Functionality seems similar. So whatever those differences are. Uh, yeah, it has to do with the features available. Uh, in, in our case, we have uh, dynamic uh, choice fields. Um, we have an enhancement, uh, enhanced support uh, on uh, control, on input and output. Of course, we support events. So there, there are many benefits. You should use uh, this version for sure. Sorry. Yeah, and just another comment because, because it's a good question. Because if you look on the Innovation Hub, we have both out there. And for those of you not familiar with the difference, the the scripts is really just launching the script and the data comes in, you wait for it to get done, and then you get the result back. The good thing about it is a very simple way to do an extension. All you have to do is write the script. So it's very simple and very and very quick if, if you wanna do straightforward things. The universal extension capability that was demonstrated today is meant to have more sophisticated communication back and forth. One thing we didn't show in the demo was you can send events back up to the controller that can cause other things to happen. And then you can have the, the choice commands. And so what Seamless just talked about, more of a real-time communication back and forth versus a, a launch and then get a, wait for it to complete. Last also, just don't forget that uh, with universal extensions, we have also packaging of dependent libraries, right? You do not require installation on the agent side. Yeah. This is a very, a very, a very positive side on uh, on that thing. But we will 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 keep will keep supporting both 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 methods because they they both have their purposes. Mm -hmm. With jobs as code, does that mean any task can be automated this way, or only ones that use universal templates? No, really anything, because the, the jobs is code, and it's not just tasks. I mean, you, you, you could do other objects in, in UAC as well, because what we're doing is we're exporting the definition from the controller in a JSON format. And typically what we've had customers do is put that in a version control tool like GitLab or Azure DevOps. Then they kind of modify it from that JSON format, and then they push it up, push it back up to the to the con con controller with, with, with all those updates. And what we're looking at too is also to, um, obviously you gotta be careful about changing it in version control system and then changing it through the UI because then all of a sudden you're, you're kind of getting that out of sync. But we're coming out with capability to where um, there's events on the controller side so that if you do make a change to the GUI, it, it can update the version control system so that you can actually do it both both ways. But typically customers do it one way or, or the other because you it's based on preference. Does Stone Branch supply trainings to learn to work with FI Visual Code UI Integration Hub? Good question. There's there's no formal so at the, at the, so there's no formal training on building extensions or using the um, the SDK dev dev platform but we have had some of our solution engineers help customers learn it and, and kind of spend some, some time with them. So I would, I would say if, if you're interested in getting help with learning it, then you can reach out to uh, your contact at Stone Branch and, and, and they can help organize that. But I, I, I would encourage all the documentation now is in the standard product documentation and we appreciate any feedback that, that people have from that documentation. Also, if you go on where the UIP CLI, which is on the Python um, package you know, registry where you can download it, there's no documentation up, up there. And any, any feedback people have, that'd be great because we're constantly looking at improving the tools. Stone Branch, real-time hybrid IT automation for whatever comes next.